from Microbe TV. This is Q&A with A and V. I am Vincent Racaniello. And joining me tonight from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hello, Amy. Hello, Vincent. How are you today? Before I even said a word, we have one thumbs down. How about that? <laughs> what? I'm fine, actually. Um, I had a good day. I um, edited TWIV. I uh, did a twin, and I taught virology. Uh, and what about yourself? No, no, I don't want to ask that. <laughs> yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say today was great. I learned how to use the two hundred thousand dollar machine. Oh, but, that's right. Uh, what is it called? Ten X Genomics machine, right? No, it's a chromium controller. You got to use the right control. name. A chromium chromium controller. controller. Yes. And it was very exciting. You push a button and 18 minutes later, it does something. It's very exciting. Um, and then uh, I learned a few things that then annoyed me. Yeah, well, it's time to move on, I think, right? To what? <laughs> you know what I mean. Move on. To to another Move place, to that, where? the place to that appreciates what? you, a place that appreciates you, where it's not just me that appreciates you, right? Yes, it's time for me to move on to a place that appreciates me. But my mother's not taking borders. <laughs> no, I I don't mean your mother. <laughs> I mean I know, but it was a joke. Did you not get the joke? I mean, come yeah, on, my it. sense of humor it. is totally wasted on you. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. <sighs> By All the right, way, so before where's we my go, little, where's my little fundraiser? We need to yeah, fundraise. I was for just going to say before we move on, please tonight help to support uh, Amy's research. GiveNow.Columbia.edu. Uh, if you uh, go to that website, Giving.Columbia.edu. What, what did I put up? Give now. I think it's the same. Uh, you click make a gift and then you type enterovirus and then you will see a list of things come up and that will show up and you click on it and then you can put in your payment information. We'd love to have your support of uh, Dr. Rosenfeld's research on enteroviruses. Yeah, which enteros are really cool. Extremely cool. They're coming. Extremely. They're coming. They're becoming more and more cool. Yeah, and Amy is making Every them day. cool. Uh, you folks have no idea how cool amy is making enteroviruses uh, and her work is really awesome and underappreciated so if you would like to appreciate it please uh, help her out she would like that very much the other great. thing i would like to say is thank you to our moderators uh, before we start it's a thankless job although we do thank you it's a thankless job uh, thankless against all the horrors. thankless so steph thank you vanity Tom, uh, Les, and Frank P. We got the whole crew tonight. There's actually one young lady who shows up very rarely, um, and I don't remember her name, but uh, that would be the entire crew. But this is the main core crew who shows up uh, every Wednesday night along with us, and we really appreciate it. Believe us. We really appreciate it. Uh, someday we can repay you, we hope, right? Right, Amy? Well, you can tell them that they can all be invited to the incubator opening on May 18th. I thought it was the 19th. Oh, the 19th? Whatever the Thursday is. It's the 19th. Right okay, well, I told yeah. Eric the wrong day. <laughs> I don't want we'll Eric there anyway. It. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. What are you um, talking about? We love Eric. Don't so pick maybe, on yeah, Eric. May 19th, we're having a uh, opening, official opening of the incubator, which means I have to get it done by then. That's Oy. why we're doing it this weekend. We're doing the save the date emails and hanging. Did the shelves come? No, a lot of other stuff came, but that's all for the recording side of the. Uh, did the, the, I got where, the new? Did you? I got the new plate. I got the new wall text for uh, Fred Murphy's corrects his birth date, so I put that up. That's good. Um, well, before. Did the, why did you look into where the shelves are? They were I supposed not, to be here no. last week. No, this week they're coming. 26, they said. Is that last week? All right. Well, I'll check yeah. into it tomorrow. Okay. 
And the 26th um, was Saturday. Okay, I'll check into it tomorrow. The other thing I wanted to say before we start answering questions, so uh, Renzo is our friend in Canada, and he asked me to ask Amy, what's wrong with an Asiago bagel? So can you, in just a minute or less, tell us what's wrong with an Asiago bagel? So you never put trife, you never mix trife. So you can't eat anything. So you don't, yeah, you don't mix trife. So no milk and meat and no stuff. And also depends on how you make what's in the bagel dough. So you never make bread with milk products. Okay. This came from our discussion on the last TWIV when I mentioned that the, a new bagel shop opened underneath the incubator, right underneath. And I was so excited. And Amy said, how many times of types of bagel do they have? Because there are only a few approved types. And Asiago exactly. is not one of them, right? No. Okay. Cheese bread is not a bagel. Cheese bread is cheese bread. Understood. Okay, let's, uh, let's do some questions here. Now, a lot of questions about... A, Another booster. Um, but we'll start with James, who says, Dr. Offit talks about original antigenic sin with respect to COVID boosters. Can you explain this? Also, any stories from Amy about her time in Montreal? <laughs> so, Amy, we, we don't have... Original antigenic sin comes when you make a different booster compared to the first one that you got. So for influenza no, virus... No, it comes when you get infected with a different form of the virus. Well, that could happen also, booster. yeah. But so for flu, it's got... all about vaccinating. Actually, it's about being infected no, with a different strain from what you first yeah, encountered. Yeah, it's not about vaccinating. So you make, a, you make a response predominantly to the first strain that you were infected with, right? You make a resp The first response dominates, and then yes. it interferes and causes... Uh, if you get in fact reinfected by something that's slightly different or completely different from the initial agent that you got infected with, the response is not as good and can be detrimental. So what would be the uh, situation with, with boosters? What is Offit talking about? So he must be referring to the fact that when you got boosted with the first two doses mm -hmm. and stuff, it didn't respond well to Omicron. Okay. Suggesting that you would get, you aren't as well protected. And if you done challenged with the original virus, you would be more protected against the original virus. So this protection is that you have some kind of problem recognizing this this form of the virus. And I'm not sure that that's 100% correct. I'm not sure that we actually have really good data to support that because everybody does the experiments differently. Okay. So if you had a standardized neutralization assay, it would be better. Anagenic sin, original anagenic sin, I would think, a better example is dengue than flu. All right. Because it's clear, right? Yeah. For a dengue, it's clear. Yeah, but they call they don't call it original antigenic sin, although you're right, it is. But they call it, you know, antibody-mediated enhancement. But it is well, original. It's the yes. same thing. You preferentially respond to the first uh, virus that you have seen. That's absolutely right. So a number of people are asking me if we get snail mail at the incubator. And yes, we do now. It's arriving regularly. I actually put a mailbox on the door. <laughs> if you follow me and on can Instagram. Can you explain how this got fixed? Do you want to explain how the snail mail problem got fixed? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so I want to hear this. <laughs> So I, you know, went to the post office. I called people. Nothing worked. And then Amy said, maybe you should put a sign on the door. 
<laughs> of course, it involves Amy. So our incubator, the main door, the previous tenant, the main door, I had shut and bolted shut and the doorknob taken off. Okay. And so apparently the mailman thought the place was vacant because he saw the door where he used to deliver mail. He said, ah, it's vacant. So he pushed all the mail back. So Amy said, put a sign on the door. I put a big sign on the door. Lo and behold, the mail starts to show up. The sign says, go down to the next door for suite 703. So sometimes the low tech solution is what you need, like screens, you know, on the windows to stop mosquito bites. So thank you, Amy, for suggesting that. We're getting me at 352, 352 7th Avenue, suite 703 is uh, Microbe TV. We have beautiful signs on the door. We have a mailbox. I actually got a check from one of you lovely donors the other day at the incubator. Holy cow. Come by and visit. If you can't make it on the 19th of May, just send an email and we can arrange a time for you to visit. I'd be happy to show you around. Uh, so Richard and others who want the the, uh, the mail address, there you go. <clears throat> uh, it would be bad for my 82-year-old mom to have her fourth dose. No. They are wanting to keep antibodies high here and are giving over 75. No, it's not a bad idea. If you ask me, is the science justified? I'll say no. There's barely justification for the first booster. I don't know if any of you have seen this lovely uh, editorial in, where is it? The uh, Wall Street Journal. Is that it, Amy? Mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal. You likely don't need a fourth COVID shot by Phil Krauss and Luciana Borio. Phil Krauss worked at the FDA and resigned because he didn't think the first booster was needed. And Luciana Borio has been an, a previous assistant associate director of FDA or whatever. Um, so this is a very good editorial which says, you don't need it. Beat it. And if you don't subscribe, let me know. I will um, send it to you. What do you think about that? I was chatting with Amy on the train tonight about it, not in person, but via text. And the data that the FDA used, data out of Israel involving a very small difference in the effect of a small dose on hospitalization and severe disease and not controlling for different patient populations with different comorbidities. And that's one of the things that they point out in that editorial. The data are flawed. And I don't see why the FDA should make a decision based on flawed data. So there you have it. Oh, what was the question about viruses? Did I pass it? <laughs> viruses. Uh, where's the virus question? No one masks in the Netherlands anymore, but all restrictions are dropped. All restrictions are dropped. We still have 27,000 detections a day, 35 fatalities. No one worries about the virus. Well, the detections, as Amy would tell you, because you're, you're testing. Was public health ever this bad? Was there ever a golden age? Yeah, Laurie Garrett said there was a golden age when places like the CDC were run by public health people, not by administrative physicians. And you know what I mean by that. Physicians who are administrators. They're not epidemiologists. Uh, so that, that day is over. I don't know where we got to that, but there are no, and Lori said in New York City, there are no public health people running New York City public health. It's all administrative types. And so who is going to lose? We are. It's our health at stake. <laughs> Thank you, BJR2, for your contributions. Two PharmDs in San Francisco await your view on the second boost. No, no, no. No second boost. No data to support it. Protection against severe to fatal disease is still high with one boost. And probably even before that with no boosts. But sure, we'll give you one booth, boost. And what do you think, Amy? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sounds good. Okay, let's see. What else have we got here? Mm, I'm a healthcare provider. Oh, and at the beginning of the pandemic, we were reusing N95s. The supply issue of PPE was ridiculous. 
and we st still need to improve access to high-quality masks for the public. That's because it's not a priority in this country. It's done after the fact as a reaction, and no one wants to think ahead of time. Everyone wants to save money. Actually, everyone wants to put the money in their pockets. We're talking about politicians here. Don't get me started. Oh, you already did. <laughs> Amy, if you had to use one household item to kill a variety of viruses, what would you use? <laughs> bleach. Yeah, bleach is really good. Unfortunately, it makes your clothes turn white, right? Well, it depends on what concentration you use. Sometimes. Sometimes it gives holes, and sometimes it's you want your whites white. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if you want, if you have a nice sweater on like you have, what is that blue? It's a greenish. It's cashmere. You don't wash it, so it doesn't matter. Oh, you don't wash it. No, it goes to the dry cleaner. You dry definitely cleaner. do not wash it. Does it? yeah, ay ay ay. Good thing you're not a fashion consultant. My clothes would be a disaster. Oh, that's not what I'm. I am. I'm a virologist. Is that good? Sure. Um, can T cells directly inactivate viruses or lice virus infected cells? They, they, they lice, lice virus, virus infected, infected yeah. cells. I'm not aware that they lice. So here's the thing. The, the peptide that's recognized by T cells on the cell surface is presented by an MHC1 molecule. And virus particles don't have MHC1 to present the peptide, so it wouldn't work. It has to be a peptide presented in MHC for a T cell to recognize it. So there's no way that the virus can lice, there's no way the T cell can lice a virus, okay? Is that good, Amy? Yeah, sure. All right, so me A, what percentage protection do I have with a two-dose Pfizer? Very difficult to tell because we don't know anything about you, right? But in many people- I don't need to know anything about her. Okay, what's your answer? So what protection do you have? You have enough protection where you don't get severe disease if you got in infected. Yeah. But she so wants a number. I don't need to know anything about you. There is no number because that implies we understand correlatives of protection and we don't. That implies that if you said you had 100 and if you had a neutralizing titer of 1024 that you're fully protected and if you had a neutralizing titer of 64 you have nothing and we can't say that and then you can't say anything about the amount of interfering gamma of interfering gamma that would correlate with t-cell activity so i don't care what the number is it means nothing okay but you're so you're confident to saying you're well protected against severe disease yeah. and death with two doses. Yeah. Yes. For All sure. right. Rob, thank you for your contribution. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, I don't know if this means us. I've never been to Cuba. Have you, Amy? My sisters. But no, I have uh, not. Not you? Okay. No. My sisters and one of their friends went to Cuba. Folio Pete, wow, that's a nice name. Is Hep C hundred percent curable now? Nothing is a hundred percent, but it's close enough. There's one thing in life that's a hundred percent, Amy. What death? Death. We're all well. If die. I cut off your head and I put it in a cryogenic thingy, then apparently it's not a hundred percent because the Bezos Biotech Company is going to fix it. So I could be yeah. reincarnated because oh, yeah. they are going to reset the cellular clock. Sure, I'm going to reverse aging. Believe Jeff Bezos, right? Can't even treat his own workers properly. Well, that has nothing to do with whether or not he's believable. That has to do with whether or not he is a decent human being. This is because he has so much money, and his phallic symbol of sending people to the edge of the earth is out of range for most people. <laughs> That's a TikTok quote, right? Sure. I don't know. I don't know, understand anything. Anyway, it's not 100%, but it's really good. With multiple antiviral cocktails, you've got treatment down to a couple of months. It's really nice. Really, really a, a success story. 
Excellent. So Animal Party is here. I know. I and talked what's... to Jen this morning. She emailed me pictures of her baby quail. They're so big now. She's got a lot of them. Is she going to eat and them? And then she's, no, she's giving them to her mom. Oh, her mom's going to eat them. No, they're going to be f kept by her mom. Her For mom what? has a Pets? big pl I guess so. Her mom has a big place in the Berkshires. Oh, cool. Yeah. Anyway, she wants to know if there are viruses in space. She's asking you specifically. No. There are no viruses in space. Space is a big place, Amy. Vincent, there are no viruses in space. It's full of irradiation. Okay. <laughs> right. Amy's knows she's she's got it, you know. That's fine. I I I would agree there are no viruses in space. But for there to be viruses, there would have to be some kind of life form, right? Yeah, in theory. Although maybe not, considering the fact that an, uh, the basis of the RNA world probably was a virus. So, Amy, what happens if a, we send up a, a phallic symbol spaceship, okay, and it happens to be contaminated with a lot of virus, and it goes... They probably burn up as they go through the atmosphere. You think so? Because it's okay. really, for sure. Do you know how hot that thing gets? Well, on the way in, right? No, on the way out. It gets hot on the way out too, yeah? For sure. Okay, but not as hot as in the way in. <sighs> Look, on the way in, it glows for God's sake, right? It glows on the way out too. All right. Here's another question, which is more in our wheelhouse. What's the size of a SARS-CoV-2 virus? I would think it must be a top near the difference of a droplet versus aerosol. No, it's, uh, it's between 80 and 120 nanometers. Much smaller than any of those droplets. Well, the, the, uh, point 0.1, it's, so a nanometer is 1,000 microns. Right. So 180 nanometers is point 0.1 micron. Exactly. So... That's the thing is that maybe you can't get enough in a aerosol, right? The tiny, tiny droplets to initiate an infection. Really? I don't know. You want to put your money on that? I said maybe. Do you have I any data? I said maybe. Right? That's the key. That's the question. Are there enough SARS-CoV-2 in a aerosol droplet? Five microns. Well, it, doesn't, it depends on how much you actually need. So, Amy, how many SARS-CoV-2 infectious virus particles would you need to initiate an infection in my nose? No idea. Nobody knows. <laughs> Was that a joke? Yeah. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is we guess what, what is it like that you need like 10 Ebola's or something or other to initiate an infection? Where did that come from? I don't know, but I thought like at one point you said that there was like you needed 10 or 100 of some virus. I thought well, you Ebola. need 10 infectious particles of norovirus. That's known because they've okay. done human so, challenge studies. Yeah. So, so right there, that would be if it were transmitted by a droplet or aerosol, it would be a viable aerosol would be viable, right? So you, with that, you have no idea if it's 10 for SARS-CoV-2. Or if it's 15,000. So Agreed. you can't Agreed. say anything. Agreed. All right. Did you see an article by China CDC called The Wolf is Indeed Coming? I found it curious that China made this somewhat dramatic alert to the world. What do you think? What, what does this mean, the, the wolf is coming? Do you know what that's about, Amy? I have no idea. Where is this article published? Uh... Well, it's a Chinese children's story, that's for sure. <laughs> I don't know what okay, it's like. Well, I'm not big into I'm not big into children's stories, except for like maybe Pat the Bunny and Harry the Purple Crayon. Crayon, crayon. Not really. So Priscilla, tell us what it said and we can give you our thoughts, okay? Not that it makes much of a difference, but tell us what they said. Okay. Hmm. Why do you think the FDA fell for the Israel data? 
Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it's clear not not convincing. And obviously, P- Kraus, Phil Kraus and Lu- Luca Borio don't think it's convincing, and neither do the offits. So I'm not, we're not the only ones out here. I can't answer that question because I don't know what they're thinking. I am not privy to the deliberation process. Well, there know. wasn't really a deliberation process. This decision was made without the outside review committee. Right. Okay. If COVID can present children as MISC when entering the body through the GI, then is it additionally considered an enterovirus? No. What is this entering the body through the GI, Amy? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't enter the body through the GI. The MISC happens through a respiratory entry, just like everything else with COVID. Yeah, so I don't know. But it's not an enterovirus. Does not it is not a small single stranded non encapsulated virus. What is your projection for the fall in terms of a new COVID variant? I just have a bad feeling that a more virulent strain is on the way. This virus just keeps mutating. Uh, why do you think it has to get more virulent? Because you have a bad feeling? That's not a good reason. Do you have some scientific evidence? If you say it just keeps mutating, then I'll say all viruses keep mutating. So what have you got specific to SARS-CoV-2? And the answer is nothing. So Marina, don't worry about it. Do you have any predictions, Amy? I predict at 9.15, I'll say to you, I have to go and put the overlay on my plaque assay. No, no, about a variant in the fall. We know that you're gonna you're gonna go back to work. You think I think there'll be a new variant? Yeah, there will be. And you'll ask me about it here. You'll ask us about it, and we'll say, "Don't worry about it." And in the end, you won't worry about it. Well, there was a new variant yesterday, and there'll be a new variant tomorrow. By definition, is, is it a, a variant of concern? I don't know. No, Do you want VOC me to call is- it on the telephone and ask? VOC is very special, right? Well, she didn't ask if it was a VOC. She just said if it was a variant. And so, yes, there was a a new variant yesterday. There was a new variant today. There'll be a new variant tomorrow. I don't know. Do you want, I cannot really just call it up and ask what it does not plan to become more infection. So I don't know. Maybe there'll be antigenic variants. I doubt they're going to be different virulence. Okay. That's not what we see with this virus. Uh, Frank P is in New York, so do come, do come on the nineteenth. Uh, it's uh, it's right in your neighborhood. Okay, here's another one for you, Amy from Animal Party. Can you compare and contrast a virus and a spore? <laughs> well, they both. Uh, so a spore is actually a live thing. It's a quiescent state of a fungus, whereas a virus is yeah. not. Yeah, whereas a virus is is a blob of protein and nucleic acid, and it can't do anything on its own. Whereas a spore can germinate and become a new uh, organism all on its yeah. own. You can add water it's and just it will quiescent. germinate, yeah. yeah. If you add water to a virus, what you get is a virus in water. Well, yeah, but you, yeah, yeah, but you know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Frank, what time on May 19th? Do we have a time yet? Yes, it's 5 to 7. It's a sink set. I thought it was 6 to 8. No, it's 5 to 7. Is 5 a good hour? People are working. Nobody is working on 5 o'clock. All right. How can SARS-CoV-2 become more durable? Officials say it's three times more durable. BS, it's I don't BS. I what durable means. This is nonsense. More durable doing what? And anyway, what's an official? What's an official? I, I don't know even what that means. They don't know anything about durability. It's nonsense. If, well, what is durability? All right. So I, I, I have a feeling I understand, Amy. You want me to give you my thought? Sure. And then I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. Well, why is that any different from any other time? <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't know. I was wondering that too, to be honest. I was like, okay, I mean, that's how this works. So I wasn't quite clear why we thought that this response would be different. Oh my God. Did you see, you know, I put a picture of Amy and me on Instagram. I don't know if anybody saw it. Uh, but there were some nice comments, a lot of nice likes. And one guy said, is Amy keeping you in line? <laughs> and I said, what do you think? I, I'm not clear. Not clear so, of what? Well, people, that assumes I micromanage. I don't micromanage. I, give, no, I, don't say I you tolerate micromanage. certain things. And then if you cross the line, you get put back in, the, in line. Like, I don't understand. I okay, want to show whatever. you this. I want to show you these pictures, by the way. They're very nice. Let me just show them to you. Um, I'm sorry. I have to stick them in the thing here. Blah, 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 blah. Here we go. Uh, so this, actually, this is a picture I took of Amy on the subway, the 168th Street subway. Isn't that cute? So they have a nice oh, mosaic. That's when I was going to Edmonds, right? That's when I was going to go for Edmonds. Yeah, look how happy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, and it's good. a nice mosaic, isn't it? A beautiful mosaic. Yeah. Okay. It's good. So uh, that's that. But the one I wanted to show you was where is it? This one. So I took this in the lab, right, and uh, put it on Instagram. Got a lot of likes, and and that's when a guy said, "Is Amy keeping you in line?" It's a nice picture, don't you think? Yeah, it's good. Amy? Yeah, it's good. We're a gradient of orange. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, durability, I would, I think <laughs> what it means, they think it can survive longer on surfaces, Omicron variant, which I think is BS. I just don't think it, it, it's true. And well, is there any data? Anything. And what difference does it make if it survives longer on surfaces? It's not transmitted by fomites. So exactly I don't understand. Right. Exactly right. Meaningless, more meaningless stuff. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand. Turn the YouTube on for us. What are you talking about? Turn the I YouTube on. I don't know what that means. It is, isn't it on? I don't know. Okay, uh, Andrew in New Zealand. My copy of PD Seven arrived safe and sound. Wow, that's great, Andrew. I'm glad it wasn't that long. It was like two weeks. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Sorry it took so long, and. Um, well, that's Enjoy. better than the virology textbook that's out of print. Yeah, so totally I'm trying to send people virology textbooks, and the bloody publisher is out of stock. So I have to buy one copy a week on Amazon. That's all they have. I buy a copy. I try and buy 10, but it, then it reduces it to one. So I get one at a time. And, and by the way, Amy, today I got one from Amazon. The box was broken open. Oh, not so good. The book was in it, but not on. Well, that's good. Uh, what do you know about variants XD, XE, and XF? <laughs> I don't even know what X means. <laughs> D. Well, it's a it's a recombinant between Delta and uh, Omicron, and of course the press is calling it a, a Frankenstein virus because they figure oh. Delta and Omicron together must be making something even worse. This is just such BS. It's it's just pathetic and nauseating. There's no evidence that it's of any importance at all. It's barely fit. It's not spreading. So that's it. That's all you need to know. As Amy said, actually, every hour of every day, a new variant arises. Right, Amy? Yeah. Every hour. I would even say every minute. As soon, at, whenever a person's infected, there's a new variant that arises because a variant is simply a, an isolate with some sequence difference from the other one. And we don't know yet about Amy's new gig. Stay tuned, right? People are asking if you've gotten news about your gig. No, not yet. I don't got a gig. Not yet. Are you finally getting snail mail? Yes. Yes. Is it likely or unlikely for new safety issues to pop up with mRNA boosters? What do you unlikely. think, Amy? Unlikely, unlikely. highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. 
highly unlikely. Um, because they've been in so many, so many people and it's all working good, but working well. I, I encourage you to listen to the TWIV that drops tonight where we discuss why the RNA vaccines give you such side effects. It's really interesting. Yeah, I know. I, I read the paper and then I picked the paper. As always, yes. Not always. It goes awry when I don't. <laughs> hey, Elena, don't Elena agrees with you 100% about bagels. Good. That's good that Amy's I know, and now I have to, to go on Sunday when I hang the painting. I'm going to have to test. I'm going to have to look at this bagel pub. You doubt it's Probably that I, a roll with a hole. You think I can't enjoy a bagel just because I'm Italian, right? No. It has nothing to do with your ethnicity. Right, let's put it another way. You think I can't judge a bagel because I'm Italian? No, it has nothing to do with your ethnicity. All right, what does it have to do with? My lack of taste? <laughs> your lack of expertise. I've been eating bagels all my life. Doesn't help. You know, a lot of people like bagels. Not just Jewish people, you know. Well, I never said it was a, just a Jewish person. Hey, by the way, I, where did a bagel originate? My uncle was, was, was a bagel baker. Was it in Hungary? Don't you they think I, it's Poland. It's Poland? Bialystok. Well, those are Bialys, not bagels, right? No, it's the same region. It's Bialystok. Okay. My sister spent a year in Poland, and they went to Bialystok. And Joan Nathan has it all down pat in a book. Okay. And my great uncle was a bagel baker. So really, you want to have an argument with me about bagels? We can have an argument. That was but your I, great uncle a bagel baker? If I like a bagel, I like it. That's all I can tell you. And you can't say I can't like it. What do you think about that? I didn't say you couldn't like it. I just said it didn't mean it was good. Oh, okay. It's a funny There's distinction. A you have a funny <laughs> distinction. All right. Rach Cora wants to tell us our tiny hospital is full Thankfully, the death rate is low on the Isle of Man, 86,000 population. We're giving our over 75s a fourth dose to keep antibodies high. Is that safe? Sure. Sure. I, I think it's fine. I don't think you need to do it, but that's what you guys are doing. You're not listening to us, and that's fine also. <laughs> what do you think happened to the 1918 virus? Uh, it it uh, continued to circulate in people. It went into pigs and circulated. It still circulates to this day in pigs, but it's changed a bit, of course. And it, it's an H1N1. And today we have 2009 H1N1 was sort of a reincarnation of the 1918 virus, but um, because there it, was, it had changed over the years, and it also there's also population immunity to some extent, so it didn't have the same devastating effects. It's not the same virus. I'm not sure we can say how it mutated to become because we don't have the series of isolates that you would need to do that. And as Amy would say, how would you test it anyway? Well, it talks to you. So, so eating bagel with lox and cream cheese is traff? Trife. Technically, yes. A lot of people do that, right? Everybody does it. Steph says there's cheese, there's cheese bread in every culture. I'm sure that there is, but technically, that so technically you're not supposed to do it. But it's, but you overlook it. There's some, you know, there's some exceptions, like I before you accept after C. There's some exceptions. <laughs> All right, so Simon you just says, wouldn't put make a you just wouldn't put a ba you wouldn't put ham and cheese or a BLT on a bagel. Simon says, "I'm sorry, but as a British half Jew, much as I like New York bagels, I'm not sure I'd call them bagels. More New York, less bagel." Well, today a lot of bagels are really doughy. They're soft and they're really big, and they don't have a really good crust, so they're totally different. Yeah. Well, the That's bagel true. pub downstairs, they're big and fluffy. So they're big, fluffy, soft, and doughy. Yeah, 
That's and probably. I, they're not doughy. No, they are they have a lot of air in them, so they're not doughy. Yeah, that's like them. probably. Yeah, that's not really a bagel. Okay. But it's okay. They All right, moving away bagel. from bagels. If you, if you, if we had locked everything down for a few weeks early on, could we have avoided a lot of deaths? Maybe. Probably early on in like 2020, probably. Yeah. But remember, it was being denied by certain individuals. I, I also think that if China hadn't waited a month to lock down, it would have helped also. But, you know, that's all in the past. I think it was already here way before that. Would you say that the public health in Cuba is a function of a totalitarian socialist regime or because of the innate pre-revolution culture? I don't know enough about it, but I do know that they have a good health care system. They have a really good health care system. They have some good research. They have good vaccines. They have good health care. Um, and I don't know what the reason for that is. It's a good question, though. I, I think other people may be able to address it better than we can. Uh, does long COVID vary with the variants? I don't think we have enough data. You don't think we can say that there was more with one variant versus the other? No. I don't think so either. I also think the data, because we don't have a diagnostic test for long COVID, it makes it a little difficult, right? It's based on questionnaires. Well, it's a clinical diagnostic, a diagnosis. Right. Which is always difficult. Right. There's no test involved. Yep. Would it be wise to wait for the next wave to get my booster <laughs> since it contracts after four months? I want to be at the highest protection. Wait for the next wave and then immediately get a booster if that's what you want to do. Yeah. And then what is it? Seven to 14 days you get it. Well, a little shorter. Three or four days your anamnestic response kicks in. Do we know anything more about long COVID or brain shrinkage? Well, Dr. Griffin didn't cover it because we don't know anything. If we knew, he mentioned the brain shrinkage paper, had no idea what it meant. No idea. And long COVID and brain shrinkage, no idea. No, but when we get some data, he'll cover it because he's the clinical guy, right? Are boosters EUA or approved, Amy? Uh, they're approved. Because the yeah. vac- at least for the Pfizer, the, both vaccines have been approved. So they're approved for certain ages. Yeah, they're bo- approved, not EUA, right? No, they're approved. It says authorized here. What does authorized mean? Authorized a second booster. It's an amend. Oh, the agency amended the emergency use authorizations. So they're EUAs. That's correct. Oh. I thought that they. I thought at least the Pfizer vaccine was approved. The agency amended the e- emergency use authorizations as follows. But you're right; the vaccines are approved; they're licensed. So I don't understand that. That's that's beyond my pay grade. Well beyond my pay grade. My mother had two doses of Sinovax, two doses of Moderna. She, Moderna, she should be fined. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's good. Okay, yep. two more because it's 9.15. And here's Renzo. I knew you would be here. Thank you for clarification on the G. So Renzo had asked me to ask you. So there you go. Good. Okay, so last answer on the second booster. We don't think the data justify it. There don't seem to be any downsides. Is that a good summary, Amy? Yeah. (laughs) Several groups have linked the pain-like protease to heart damage. Why are people publishing papers saying they don't know where the heart damage comes from? Go ahead, I must have missed those papers. They're not published. They're just preprints. Well, that's I don't why know. I missed them. And I don't know how you can link 
the protease to heart damage at all. If you just produce a lot of protease in heart cells and culture, that's meaningless. And I think Amy would agree with me. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Is it true uh, that Canadian bagels are much less dense than New York bagels? They're sweeter. My, uh, St. Vieter and the Fairmont are sweeter and smaller. Yeah. And they do tend to be a bit de less dense, but yes. But it's really the fact that they're sweeter. Are there any studies about long COVID on babies and toddlers? No. No. No, you worrying about cognitive learning disorders? Yes, it's a it's a valid worry. It's, yes, in a in a toddler and a child, yes, for sure. But we don't know anything about that. Regarding my hubby and I, so one shot plus COVID and two shot plus COVID still means we should get a shot to reduce long haul possibilities, even though we have hybrid immunity. Why? Why does it mean that we need to get a booster? I don't know. I'm not I, sure I, I, that 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 I'm not sure that there's any data that suggests that. No, I, I don't think so either. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, Amy, right, do you prefer do you prefer New Order or Joy Division? Joy Division. I do like New Order, but I do prefer Joy Division. Do you prefer black or orange? For what? Just answer the question. Do I prefer black or orange? Uh, I prefer black. Okay. Jen Psaki. How do you say that? Do you go Psaki or just Saki? Is triple know, that's kind of like Pataki, right? Isn't Pataki oh. like George Pataki spell his <laughs> name the same way? I remember George Pataki. Oh, gosh. Triple vaccin has already had COVID twice. Now, what, what does this mean, had COVID twice? Do you think she might be immunocompromised, not making antibodies? I think of Amy in the measles vax. I don't know what kind of COVID she's had. If she's just tested positive, that's fine. You get infected when you're vaccinated 10 times. Does, but if, if she had symptomatic disease, it's fine. If she had hospitalization, which I don't think she did, then you could talk about being a suboptimal immune response, but I don't think that's the case. I think she just tested positive twice. What do you think, Amy? Yeah, I think she probably just tested positive twice. Do third and fourth boosters go through the same clinical trials as primary doses? Nope. Look, the fourth dose was authorized by the FDA based on data out of Israel, observational data on hospitalization and deaths in a number of different age groups in people with one booster and two. It's not a clinical trial, far from it. And that's part of our problem. It's be really hard to do the trial at this point, right? No, it's not really hard to do the trial. It's really hard to do the trial to get one dose, but it's not hard to do the trial for subsequent doses. It would be pretty important to know if OAS is a thing, just skipped over it like nothing. Well, we skipped over it because we don't have right, any wait data. Wait a minute. I didn't skip over it. I explained well, it. Free Sky said you skipped over. Well, it. I didn't. We didn't skip over. It. He can go. He can wait for the recording of this live stream, and he can find out that we spent like a good two and a half minutes discussing it. And I don't know where it came from because I don't understand the. I don't understand how he says that there's original sin, considering the fact that there's really very little data about whether or not you, when you get reinfected, you get more severe disease because the majority of people who they're talking about who got infected were vaccinated before. And that's how they concluded that Omicron was more mild. 
So I don't understand where he would have come up with the idea that there was original sin because original sin suggests that the disease would be more severe. And that's not what we observed. So I don't really understand. And I don't know where the data is that would have led him to that so that I could figure out how I misinterpreted what I my thought process was. So Sorry. I don't really agree with Free Sky 52. So Amy, it's... Let, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So an Omicron-specific booster was tested somewhere. I don't remember where. Maybe it was yeah, Israel. it was found out not to do anything. It, could it was that found be original out only sin? to protect against Omicron and not do anything against anything anybody else. All right, so that's not. I don't OAS. know that that's. I don't know that that's original sin. Yeah. All right. Because the assumption is, is so like you would say for any for any virus, you would say that. The ancestry virus, protection against the ancestor of virus would lead you to protection against all future variants. But the future variants do not necessarily protect against the ancestral virus because it's been a, it's been evolved away. So I don't know that you could, would conclude that it was an it was original sin. I don't think that that's the right conclusion. All right, Amy, I could keep asking you questions, but do you want to go or do you want to continue? Well, my plates are going to dry out, and then go I'll ahead. be really to... annoyed that my plates dried oh. out because this is an important plaque assay. All right. And my fellow polio people just found two new antibodies in their stockpile. Very I exciting. Found you good an I found you some antibodies yesterday, too. You did, but so did Koistia and Diana. They just okay. they emailed me that they have purified monoclonals against Sabin and against uh, wild type, but I, I'm not sure that they know where they bind. I'll have to ask. Excellent. All right. You should do your plaque right. assay. Don't, don't ruin it. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. All right. I'll so see you'll you. take care of the other? I will. Okay. I don't want the wrath um, of Amy descending upon me. Yeah, that's not good. Um, what is tomorrow? Thursday. <laughs> I see you Friday, right? Are we doing mice on uh, Friday? Well, two CO2 tanks probably may need to be changed on Friday, or at least yeah, one. Okay, no worries. Um, We'll have to discuss because we'll have to speed it up because I have a antibody meeting with uh, Koistia and a collaborator at one, and then TWIV is at three, and I need to do experiments. Okay. We'll have to We'll have to work on it. Okay, yeah, we you, need Amy. to work on it. Thank you, Amy. All right. All right. I'll talk Bye. to you later. Bye. Bye. Okay, folks. Now, tell me something. A lot of people said, we come to this only for Amy, but I stay another hour after she leaves. Do you want to just stop or do you want to continue? I have no hurt feelings if you want to stop. If you want to continue, it's great because you know I like to answer questions. So let me know. I won't be harmed. I won't be insulted. That's the word because it's Amy, right? Okay. Will a Moderna booster stimulate the broader range of antibodies previously seen developed via B cell somatic hypermutation? Yeah, of course it will. Uh, it, it, they all will. Yes. They all will. So would Pfizer and even uh, some of the other vaccines would do the same thing. I just returned from a wake, only one wearing a mask. I know a lot of people recently infected in New Jersey. I don't want to be one of them. We'll continue wearing my mask. It's working for me. You, uh, what we say is respect people's choice. Not a problem. Uh, Columbia no longer has a masking requirement. I teach without a mask. But um, it's okay. Some students wear masks, no problem. I'm happy not to wear one. Uh, okay, you want the uh, address again. Let me type it out for you. How's that? I'm going to type it out. Sorry about the noise. Oops, uh, I didn't finish it and it went away. Why did it do that? Maybe I can't hit return. That's why. Sweet 
703 New York, New York 1001. There we go. 352 7th Avenue. We, we'll put it over here for a while. Suite 703 New York, New York 1001. Okay. And I get mail. What do we know about the previous tenant? Ah, there are Russians. <laughs> Actually, there were Russians who sold visas to visit Russia. And they had, they had a big safe in the place. And they had these three booths where people would come in and sit down. There was glass, you know, like a bank and all that stuff. They went out of business or they left. I don't know. So I inherited their place. And um, I closed one of their doors. Yeah. Mm. Is there any downside to getting a fourth dose? No. No. Uh, so uh, I rail against it because as a scientist, I don't see the science being used to justify it. But there's nothing wrong with it, except so there's no there's nothing in terms of your health that's wrong with it. In terms of a public health measure, it is absolutely un unacceptable to give people boosters every six months. Because this virus is not going away right it's going to be here forever oh, what are you going to do boost every six months this is absurd we're not thinking ahead and in my view the one boost is sufficient to prevent severe most severe disease not all so is a f second boost going to prevent a few more yeah maybe but you can't tell from the data in israel they're just poorly collected data so someone asked me why don't i like the data the numbers are, are really not impressive. I can show you the data if you'd like. No, I'm not going to show it to you. The numbers are, they've compared, uh, was it deaths or hospitalization? All right, let me look at it. Uh, let's see, where did I put the paper? I think I put it in TWIV 882, Israel's second boost preprint. So here are the numbers. <sighs> And so this is a preprint. Let me show it to you. Hang on. Let me get rid of this address now. Let's turn on some screen sharing. Producer, thank you. All right. Second booster vaccine and COVID mortality in adults 60 to 100 years old. God bless them. And I like this statement here. They decided... Um, to do an additional booster. And due to the lack of epidemiological and large-scale clinical evidence, the decision on an additional booster was highly controversial. Yeah, they decided to boost without any evidence for it. Okay, so they did this study. Our objective was to assess any decrease in mortality due to providing a second booster to an elderly population. Okay, so they looked at um, health records, right? They have half a million participants and they got rid of certain people. And so here are the numbers here. This is it. Among participants 60 to 69, death occurred in five out of 111,000 participants in the second booster group and 32. Okay, five versus 32. You're gonna make policy in the US based on a difference between five and 32? That is bad science. And these people, how are they different? You don't tell me how they're different. They could be. They might have different comorbidities because they're at different times. They're just lumped together in health records. This is a flawed study. It's meaningless. And you want to continue. Age 70 to 79, COVID in 22 out of 134,000 participants in the second booster group and 51. 22 versus 51. You want to make health care policy in the U.S. based on that? And finally, aged 80 to 100, COVID occurred death. This is all death. 65 of 80,000 in the second and 149 of 36,000. So these groups could be totally different with respect to comorbidities, all sorts of things. We don't know anything about them. So that's one flaw. And the numbers are small. So that's why I think it's lousy data that should not drive healthcare policy in the U.S. And it is. Okay? That's what I'm saying. All right here. Can you say 
Happy birthday. Hi to my friend Joe Soto for his birthday. Hi, hi, Joe Soto. How's it going? Happy birthday and stay safe. Uh, you don't need a fourth dose. Michael, thank you for your contribution. How are things going in Mexico? I read a news report today that remdesivir in pill form is supposed to be of great benefit for those infected with COVID. I'm wondering if Vincent has updated his opinion on this drug. Okay, so what you heard, Kishan, is we actually did the study on TWIV last Friday. A, an oral version of remdesivir actually existed before remdesivir. All right, it just wasn't as potent, so they didn't use it. They decided to go with the intravenous formulation. So a study came out in mice showing that yeah, oral remdesivir can reduce virus loads and reduce disease in mice. You can't put that in people. You have to do clinical trials. So this news report saying it's of great benefit is just wrong because we don't know. It has to be tested first. It could be, but it's going to take six months to do the tests at least. Yeah, it could be uh, of benefit. The problem is, all right, so it's going to have an advantage over the intravenous formulation, right? Because now people can take it earlier. They get a positive test. They don't have to go to an infusion center. They can take a pill, go get a prescription, take a pill. So in theory, it should help. Molnupiravir is a pill. Doesn't work so well. The, the improvement isn't so great. Paxlovid is much better. So just because you're taking something orally doesn't mean it's going to be better. And long, long answer, there you go. My 84-year-old mother-in-law just got COVID, has sniffles. She's vaxxed and boosted, doing great. And that's what most people are going to get, sniffles, when you're vaxxed and boosted once. Please do not tell me that most viruses, if you're a virologist, I'll listen to you, but you're not. Don't tell me most viruses get less dangerous with time. Please do not say that. This is abhorrent to me. There's no evidence for it, okay? It's a theory, and the reasons, and first of all, H1N1 that we have today is not the same H1N1 as 1918. So please do not answer questions for which you have no expertise, okay? That's why we're here. My cousin got COVID and now has weird pains in her toes and stomach issues. Have we heard of things like that? I'm sorry to get mad. Not really mad. I got mad at my class today because half of them are not showing up. And I'm like, why wouldn't you show up? This is like paying for this. Why do you cut a class? I'm not recording the lectures for you not to show up. They're like, oh, because I usually don't say anything. I'm too nice. That's no more Mr. Nice Guy. That's it. <laughs> my cousin got COVID now has weird pains in her toes and stomach issues have we thought yeah the toe remember COVID toe right there were you know the the, um, the the hematomas the clotting in the toe and pain yeah yeah there were that's certainly an issue and, and GI issues absolutely associated with COVID and these, these are probably the consequences of cytokine storms yeah so that's that's a known thing yeah Um, are you, are there any other emerging viruses you are keeping an eye on that may contribute to future epidemics? So of course, all of the coronaviruses, um, are, are potential because they have a good record at causing outbreaks, right? Influenza viruses are another one. Uh, the, um, some of the paramyxoviruses. Bats harbor a lot of paramyxoviruses. So what's a paramyxovirus? Well, measles is a paramyxovirus, but um, Nipah virus and Hendra virus, uh, which periodically cause small outbreaks in people, are can be quite deadly. And so we keep an eye on them as well. But really, any virus that we find in, in bats or rodents is a potential threat. So we, we, we I like to keep an eye on papers that... Uh, look at those, and we often do them on the podcast. 
Do you think that because many unvaxxed people are becoming immune via infection is a reason why observed vaccine efficacy drops with time? Effectiveness. Sorry, effectiveness is real world stuff. Um, effectiveness versus efficacy. Efficacy is what you do in a clinical trial. I'm just talking to myself to keep it straight. Why vac observed efficacy drops with time? That, well, you, um, your control group, you make sure they're seronegative, right? So you can't use a control group that is um, seropositive. You, that's one of your exclusion criteria, so that wouldn't be an issue. Yeah. Do you think there will be another wave in the U.S. with BA2? Does it escape vaccine easier? So, what is the there? There are just a few studies that have come out, um, looking at um, looking at that. I wouldn't say yet that it escaped vaccines easier, but it it is, seems to be slowly becoming dominant. Not really fast the way BA one did, right? But it may have some fitness advantage, so it could predominate. I think there will be more waves, yeah, of infection, but. They're mainly going to be, since so many people are now immune because of vaccination or infection, they're going to be mainly uh, mild to moderate, as we have seen many people say tonight. You know, my mother is vaxxed and boosted, and she got mild COVID. Um, and I think as people start to move around for the summer, we'll see a, a wave, and most likely in the fall as well. So how long is this going to go on? Probably forever, because the virus can affect immune people, right? Like Omicron, it just doesn't make you very sick. But that is what the common cold coronaviruses do. In fact, a lot of people every year, we just don't test for it, so we don't know it. If we tested for them, we would see waves of infection over and over. Would you worry about that? No because they cause, cause mild infections, but they cause a lot of infections, and that's what COVID, SARS-CoV-2 is going to be doing for the foreseeable future. And um, you have to just live with it. That's the way it is. It's a human virus. This is what the vaccines do. They protect you to a certain extent. And um, unless we develop something differently, not going to change. How is the air quality in the incubator? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a Corsi Rosenthal box there. No. <laughs> but I don't know how the air quality is. It seems fine to me. I don't have any issues. I could tell when air quality is crappy, right? I could cough or get a sore throat or something. It's fine. I work there all day long. It's just me. The windows are closed. There is air circulating there's an hvac system uh, in the building that's all i can tell you if you want to tell me how to measure the air quality please do if studies looking at public masking have shown modest benefit then have there been studies showing ppe in hospital settings showing great benefit i wouldn't say great benefit First of all, look, people wear PPE in hospitals. We know surgeons and the people in the OR wear masks. Otherwise, patients get infections. We know that they work from historical data, and that's why we use them. So um, I there have been some studies in, in hospital settings, but then they don't show great benefit because the tests the studies are hard to, to design and that's the same issue with um, public masking studies they're very hard to design and implement properly and I think that's part of the problem with, with them showing modest benefit but they're not going to prevent a hundred percent of infection nothing is 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 a hundred percent I think it's the best we're going to do um, and you know it's such a in the height of the pandemic when we didn't have vaccines it, it's a good idea but I, my feeling is in public with people vaccinated, we don't need them anymore. But if you want to wear them, it's absolutely fine. 
Here in Mexico, there won't be any antivirals and monoclonals for the remainder of the year. Oh, my gosh. Why? <sighs> Should those with comorbidities not get a second booster? I think if you have no monoclonals and antivirals, if you have a comorbidity, get the second booster. Yeah. I don't think it it's going to make much of a difference, but um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't hurt. So just to be safe because you don't have monoclonals and, uh, and antivirals, and that's just a shame. What is the age you think a fourth dose becomes a reasonable idea as opposed to a healthy younger person? <laughs> well, as you know, the, uh, what is it, 50, immunocompromised and 50 and over is what the FDA said. I, I don't agree with that. I'm 69. I am not getting a second booster. I don't see the reason to get it. I feel that the science tells me I don't need it. It's not because it's just something I think or feel or sense. It's the science doesn't tell me I need it. Um, what age? 80 or 90 and above, I would say. Because you're pretty frail at that age. Most people, not everyone. And why not? Get a booster as often as they want you to take it. Rhode Island has the highest percent vaccinations. The last wave seemed to be a very high hospitalization and deaths. Am I not seeing this correctly? Probably not. Probably the way you got the data is wrong. Um, these observational studies are fraught with confounding issues that are not controlled for because they take a patient population today and one six months ago, you can't compare them unless you know everything about every patient. And that's impossible. And so, oh, you can compare them. People do it all the time. And then you come up with these flawed outcomes that eventually get shown to be wrong. Like Delta is more virulent. Yeah, sure, in some hospital it was more virulent, but in another hospital it wasn't. So. It's because the studies are, are flawed. You cannot make any inference with them. So this idea of very high hospitalization and death, first of all, I don't know what you mean very high. How are the numbers achieved? Were the comorbidities equal? Were the vaccination rates equal? No, none of that. Not, I don't believe any of these observational studies. What I believe is people who are vaccinated, we, we make these observations, develop moderate disease that's important and you know hospitalization is just as I, I think death is great you can't doubt death right but hospitalization you can imagine some people yeah i feel crappy i want to be admitted where they maybe wouldn't have admitted you this is crap i'm sorry hospitalization doesn't cut it it's different in different countries it's different in new york and texas i'm sure so it doesn't work for me How come we can't find a correlative protection? Because nobody studies T cells. Nobody tries to read the paper that we talk about in TWIV. It's an opinion piece in uh, science, immunology, I think, I'm not sure, where they say we need to do more research on T cells to understand protection because we've only focused on antibodies and it's not telling us the story. And so, how come we can't find a correlate? Because we're not looking everywhere. We're just looking at antibodies, for God's sakes. They're non-neutralized, and we're only looking at neutralizing antibodies. There's non-neutralizing antibodies. There's NK cells. There's T cells. Nobody does it. Well, not nobody. Not enough people are doing it. This needs to be done in multiple places around the world in, this, in the similar kinds of studies that are done with antibodies. Why don't we do it? Because it's hard, and it's not standardized. Poor excuses. Had diarrhea five weeks, then got COVID. Five days later, diarrhea gone. Correlated. No, that's an association. You don't know anything, right? It could be anything. So you can't conclude anything. Now, if we did a study of a thousand people, we might be able to make some conclusions, but not just one. It's not how it works. My Nana lived next to a guy in Flushing who had himself frozen. Yeah, there are people who do that. Sure. Not going to happen. Not going to be revived. Be, be happy with the life you have, whatever, 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. 
you move on. That's the way it works. That's why I want to make the incubator microbe TV self-sustaining because I'm not around forever. I want it to continue to have its own, you know, somebody do a live stream and say, hey, where, where did this stuff come from? With all these scientists who are here talking to us, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> What do you think about this T-Detect T-Cell COVID-19 test? I know plenty of people that believe they might have had it, but were almost asymptomatic and never got tested. I don't think it's the, story, it's the whole story in T-cells. I think it's part of the story, and there are other things that you need to do. Uh, and it's all discussed on TWIV. Actually, the TWIV... Um, I, I misspoke. It's the TWIV that's being released at midnight. So listen to that. And, and that we talk, Brian and I did it actually. It was just the two of us and it was wonderful. It's, it's really good with uh, um, one other person. You, get, you have a good conversation. Uh, anyway, so you, um, it's not enough. T detect is not enough. If we got a J and J first instead of mRNA, what would you do to get yourself protected, or would you just be happy with a single J and J? No, I think you need two J and Js. The idea of one and done is ridiculous. It was flawed from day one. I would get two doses of J and J, and that would be fine with me. Ay, 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 you guys are unbelievable. You know, don't pick on Amy. Viruses in space, she wasn't talking about astronauts. Because you think you're so freaking smart, don't you? <laughs> I know you are. But you know what she meant. You don't have to be nitpicking. She meant, you know, just in the outside of the thin atmosphere or the thin belt around the Earth. Space. What's out there? Not, not in the astronauts. If you go to the moon, are there viruses there? Probably not. There was a virologist in space. Yeah, Kate Rubens, twice on TWIV. We, we, she's back on Earth now. She may be going to Mars, actually. Yeah. So anyway, there could be viruses. It depends on whether you think there's life on other planets, right? I don't think there is, but if you think there is, then there are viruses on some other planet. But not space, on the planet, not in space. Right on the surface of the planet is not technically space. Up there, it's a very tough environment for a virus to survive in or to retain infectivity, I should say. On the mere space station there's black yeast mm -hmm. and we used to have viruses as you know so i think we have to exclude the astronauts around the earth from this discussion right and and some of you like look at this there have been underground rivers on mars there are probably viruses why would there be viruses unless there's a living thing there we don't know just because there's an underground river and maybe there was in the past we don't uh, make conclusions without data. So you may say, well, how, how do you know there are no viruses in space? Well, because there are no living things out there floating around in space. So you need a living thing for a virus to infect. And if it's just a virus particle, it's going to be UV irradiated and inactivated pretty quickly. I mean, that's the main reason Amy said there are no viruses up there. Okay. <laughs> What are the estimates of the percent of vaccinated people who develop long COVID? Eh, it depends what studies you look at. You know, some of them are, are 10, 15 percent. Others are less than 1 percent. I just don't think, um, I just don't think we have the data yet. It's too soon to tell. Data are not good. Is Amy from New Jersey? 
she was brought up in New York, upstate New York, and did live in New Jersey for a while. So I don't know. Yeah, I know the wolf is the recombinant between Delta and Omicron. That's what I said. Yeah. Vincent, the China CDC said Delta Cron is the beginning of the mutation since the virus is in so many animals. <sighs> Listen, take what you hear from China with a grain of salt, all right? Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I don't know where they get the data that it's in so many animals. COVID, is SARS-CoV-2 is in many animals, right? But not sure about Delta Cron. I don't know where they get that from. I don't think they fell for the Israel data. I think they're hedging their bets because of public pressure. Well, whatever you want to call it, Elizabeth, it's wrong. The uh, FDA and the CDC should not give in to public pressure. It was done once during Trump administration, if you remember, they gave in and gave an EUA to hydroxychloroquine, which was a big mistake. So call it fell for, I call it fell for, because there's nothing there in the Israeli data. You can call it public pressure. Either way, it's the wrong thing to do and uh, reduces confidence in the FDA. I always had great faith in FDA and CDC. I'm losing it because of the stuff that they're doing. Yeah, I don't believe anything about Delta Cron. Not yet, anyway. Yeah, we're having an opening at the incubator on May 19th, yeah. <clears throat> but you're going to have to let us know if you're coming because we can't have 500 people there. It won't fit them. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia, for your contribution to the incubator. And Doreen, thank you for your contribution to the incubator. Uh, let's see. I did not know they had an in Instagram. I have two. I have Prof VRR. Let's put it up. Instagram, Prof VRR or microbe.tv. Here's the Instagram. Go subscribe. I post fun pictures all the time on, on both. Hey, am I going to do a live stream for the launch? I could do that. I could just put a bunch of cameras up, right, and stream it. Um, yeah, why not? I'll see. I don't know if the people would mind. You were racking yelling tonight. That was an old saying, remember, rack and yelling early in the pandemic? I thought I thought it was a brilliant name because I got mad at the stupidity that was being promulgated, and it hasn't stopped. It has not stopped. And what bugs me is we called it out early, and now people start to call it out, and we've been doing it for two years, right? No downside to the frequent boosters that we know of, except it's bad public health policy. Right? But there's no biological downside, as I've said. Where, thank you for your contribution. Where is the evidence that the common coronas were once highly virulent? Is it all just speculation? If viruses don't get less virulent, that less deadly is a function of immunity, wouldn't some still get very ill from them? Yes, and some still get very ill from common cold coronas. If you're immunosuppressed, you get very ill from a common cold coronavirus. But for the most of the population, and you know that even most of the population, people who don't have a severe immunodeficiency, they still have something that makes them more susceptible. And yet these common cold coronas pretty much are benign. So there is no evidence. It is speculation, DR. And we do that in science. It's fun to speculate about what might have happened. Maybe the common cold coronas emerged one day many years ago. They were quite virulent, and maybe population immunity tamed them. 
Because remember, SARS-CoV-2 went into a completely naive, immunologically naive population. And so older people got very sick. And if common cold coronas, they don't get very sick. Why? Because they have immunity. They've been infected all their life. So the virus doesn't have to change to accommodate that. And we have no evidence that it changes either. We have no evidence for any virus that virulence changes uh, because we don't have historical samples. Now, SARS-CoV-2, we do have historical samples from day one to the present. But measuring virulence in humans is not easy. You're going to have to do it in animals, and it might not mean anything in people. You cannot do observational studies of virulence in people for the reasons we've just talked about. Omicron in hamsters is mild. Yet, you'll, you'll hear Daniel sell, Omicron kills. It kills a lot of people. We've had a lot of deaths in the last few weeks. It's all Omicron. You're telling me Omicron is mild? That's just absurd. There's nothing to that. So um, I don't think we have any evidence that uh, the virus is becoming less virulent. We might have some in the future, but right now we don't have any for this or any other virus. But we do know that the common cold coronas are not virulent. You know, and the other thing is, the other historical bit of evidence is that when viruses spill over from animals into people, they're typically quite virulent. And, um, you know, that's probably a function of lack of population immunity. These, for example, Ebola virus spills over periodically and doesn't spread, so you never get extensive population immunity. You always have a naive population uh, for which the the virus is quite virulent. So uh, the common cold coronas over time engendered immunity in the population, and that may account for it. I'm not, I'm not ruling out that the virus might change, but we just don't have evidence either way. It's pure speculation. And I think it's a lot of fun to speculate about it. So a lot of you poo-poo speculation but I got to tell you, that's the bread and butter of science. That's what gets you to do experiments. You speculate, how might this be? Let's do an experiment to prove it. <laughs> this is the same question, whether there's selective pressure against viruses being virulent. Is there a tendency for them to increase transmissibility and decrease virulence? No. So I just talked about virulence. The... There is no selection per se for increased virulence. That in itself is not a selection. However, it can be a secondary effect of something else. I've been saying this for, for 20 years, okay? And I just see now people writing about this. Let's say, and, but on the other hand, transmission could certainly be selected for. You can imagine that's a selection force for a virus to become inherently more transmissible. But God damn it, you better show that experimentally. Don't give me any observational data saying it's more transmissible because that doesn't cut it. You need to show me the virus itself in some way. And that's also hard to do. So there can be, I think, selection for increased transmission. There's not selection for increased virulence. But if something else is selected for, Let's just say to get better transmission, the virus needs to replicate the higher titers, and that may cause more disease. So it's an indirect, the increased virulence would be an indirect cause of some other property being selected for. So that's how I look at it. But um, increased transmissibility and decreased virulence, I don't see why it has to be decreased virulence. I think the immune response can entirely account for uh, less pathogenic viruses. A fomite, F-O-M-I-T-E. It's, it's something that, a physical object that you can get an infection, like a blanket full of viruses that you wrap around you and you get infected. F-O-M-I-T-E. Totally unrelated. Don't answer if you don't want to. You think it's a good thing to be pouring all the money into the Bills Stadium up here in western New York. Well, you're asking the wrong person because not I'm, I'm not a sports fan. I'm, I think sports 
has screwed up the whole world because we pay athletes an enormous amount of money and we don't pay teachers. So I have a big problem with sports. You know, people sit back for hours and get entertained and that's a waste of time. And I have to say, when I was a kid, I loved baseball. But when I started to get serious, I said, I'm not wasting hours watching someone else. I want to do my own creation. And so, yeah, it's a waste of friggin' money to do that. But I'm sure there are a lot of people on the call who disagree. They love sports. It's fine. I'm not saying you can't have your sports, but I think it's a waste. I think people should find other ways to <laughs> amuse themselves. And man, why can't we pay teachers more and attract really good teachers to teach our kids and understand science and other things that matters? Okay. More than half of Americans may have never had COVID. This is BS. This is just BS. Flawed study. I haven't seen it, but it sounds wrong from what I know. Uh, should I get the fourth booster if I'm 55 and I had my third on October 31st? November, December, January, February, March, April. You could. If you're 55, you can get a fourth booster. No downside if you want. If it makes you feel better, yeah. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> Vinny, you read the comments too late to understand answers. Okay, so you're blaming me for not understanding because I read it too late. Uh, I don't understand that because I have no choice but to go through the questions. If I don't, people get mad. And when I do, now you're getting mad at me. So I don't know what to do. Yeah, no toasting bagels. I totally agree with that. However, if it's stale, you should toast it because otherwise it's horrible. Or maybe you should say throw it out. Is there any benefit to researching variants like PMS-20? So this was the, um, the polymutant spike, polymutant spike, PMS, where they, um, yeah, Theodora and Paul, they were, they've been on TWIB a couple of times. They made a virus with all the known spike amino acid changes that uh, made it resistant to many antibodies. Uh, but, Let's under, let me make something clear, John. This wasn't SARS-CoV-2. It was a pseudotype. It was a spike in another virus, completely irrelevant to human safety. It doesn't matter. Even if it got out, it wouldn't do anything. They didn't actually make SARS-CoV-2. And yes, that showed that you could make a spike resistant to antibodies, and that turned out to be what Omicron was. So uh, yes, it does have value, yeah. Uh, what's the use of the papillomavirus vaccine if you've already had an infection in your youth? Well, there are multiple serotypes of papillomaviruses. And so you might have had one and then you could get another one and the vaccine would protect you against that other one. So I think it's still a value, although it is not recommended past a certain age when by then you may have had multiple serotypes. Now we're talking about Bialy stock and bagels. <laughs> uh, do I recommend getting the fourth shot? Well, Patricia, I'm sure you've heard me railing tonight uh, that I do not, unless you're 80 or 90 and comorbidities uh, immunosuppressed, if you're healthy, I'm 69. I'm not getting a second booster. Not needed. Um, and what if Columbia <laughs> requires it? Well, then I don't know what to do because I go there less and less. But I still do go there, so I would have to get it. Well, you like bagels, everyone, huh? How would Amy judge a cheese jalapeno bagel? Well, Condit was talking about cheese jalapeno bagels. Apparently, you can get them in Texas and California and probably many other states. Uh, and she poo-pooed it. Um, so 
I forgot what I was going to say about that. We had a big discussion about bagels on Twitter. I cut a lot of it out because it was too much. If my employer requires a second boost, is it going to hurt me? No. You should get it so that you can stay at work. That's what I would do. You know the virus is at a low ebb when the Q&A is all about food. <laughs> Have you taught viruses live for this for online before? Well, I taught it last fall, right? I had not taught it online before. That was the first iteration. It was an experiment. And many people liked it. So I'm going to do it again. But I do want to teach some other courses. I have to squeeze them in. I'm not sure if I need to do uh, virology live again in the fall because I'd like to do a, a viruses course, you know, just cover different viruses. I'd also like to do a short coronavirus course. So I'm not um, sure that we'll do virology live this fall. We'll see. Do you think that some people who think they have mild long COVID just don't know what it feels like to get old? Uh, I, I don't think so. I believe people when they say I feel different after COVID and it's not going away. I think that you have to have that first step of believing them to get anywhere, right? How long does our vaccine last? Probably a couple of years at least, maybe five to ten years. It's hard to know until we, we move forward because we don't have experience in it. But uh, let me say that SARS-1, right, which emerged in 2003, uh, they studied people who were infected. There were no vaccines for SARS-1. They studied people who were infected, and they had memory T cells 17 years later. And so the memory T cells are part of the immune response to a vaccine. So that's good news. And so it could be over 10 years. The only exception to that would be if the virus changes substantially so that the vex, even the T cells don't work. I think that's highly unlikely. I think what we're seeing for this virus is that a good T cell response controls severe disease. And that typically does not change in variants. So I suspect these vaccines are going to last at least 10, 10, 15 years. We'll see. Patricia, come back. <laughs> we'll see. I'll let you know. When do you think they will have an antibody blood test you can get from the doctor to see how protected you are of vaccination? I don't know if we will ever have that because it it depends what you mean by protected, right? So if you want protection against severe disease, right, that's the most important thing. It's not going to be antibodies that, is, that are going to determine that. I'm, I think it's going to be T cells. And so... Uh, the, to develop a test to do that is going to take a while. It's going to be years. Yep. On the YouTube comment I made earlier, oh, you said turn on the YouTube. Yeah, you did say it, but I didn't know what you meant. It was so out of context, right? Because you have to remember, I got a lot of questions here, and I'm spinning by them, and it all out of the blue you say... Um, turn on the YouTube, I didn't put two and two together. But yeah, okay, now I get it. If I were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, I would get that. Anyway, okay, I got it now. Uh, how many For how many hours can a fallen aerosol with virus particles stay viable on top of a donut? <laughs> uh, on top of a donut, but, uh, I would say maybe 24 hours. SARS-CoV-2. Depends on the virus. A norovirus could probably stay viable for a couple of days. Yeah. If original antigenic sin could be sin could be a possible thing, isn't it my right to choose not to take the vaccine? You could, it's your right not to take the vaccine in either case. But OAS doesn't justify it. No, OAS is just going to diminish the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine. So don't use that as an excuse. If you don't want to take it, that is your right. Of course, if you work somewhere where you need to take it, then you're screwed, right? But don't use OAS as an excuse, no. How many viruses stay dormant within us? 
Well, this is a little tricky. So here's the story. So in our DNA, we have about 8% of our DNA is dormant viruses. And they're dormant because they're, they're mutated and they can't infect and, and harm. They can't replicate and harm us. So they're truly dormant. Then we have about a dozen herpes viruses, all of us in us, that are dormant a lot and periodically reactivate and reproduce and spread to other people and maybe cause disease. And then we have countless other viruses that are apparently reproducing in us all the time. They're in our blood. They're in our saliva. They're in our brains. They're in our urine, our feces. They're everywhere and hundreds probably, and they don't seem to harm us. So we are literally walking bags of viruses. And um, you should get to like them because they're with us all the time. That's why I think they're so fascinating. <laughs> Does Amy bake authentic bagels? I have not known Amy to bake a bagel. Which is, don't, you know, I only know what she tells me, but I, I don't remember her baking a bagel. Does the water make a difference? That's what Amy said on TWIV last week. It okay to drink whiskey after the booster? Yeah, sure. Whiskey's fine. It's, a, it's better make it a good whiskey, right? I actually, I would prefer a single malt, but that's just me. Saki, the P is silent. Jen Saki. Okay, I will remember that because, hey, Saki. <laughs> and Salvatore says, better to drink whiskey before and after. Yeah, yeah. Might be a good idea to keep trying to not get infected until we can better understand these brain and heart issues. Well, no one's trying to get infected, but you have to at some point get back to life. And if you can, don't have to, if you can stay home, that's great. But many of us uh, cannot do that and, and we need to get back to life and it's good for our psyche. And in fact, I would argue that the psychological advantages of getting back to normalcy outweigh any minor issues that this virus may be causing and, and minor that we don't even know the consequence of. So it will be many years, Bobby, before we understand the brain and heart issues post-infection. Many years. If you want to shut your life down for that long, it's, uh, it's okay. Saki was symptomatic. Yes, but mild. Okay, the vaccine worked. Hospitalized. Death. No. That would have told me the vaccine didn't work or she didn't, her immune system didn't work. That's the point people seem to forget. The Omicron booster data we were talking about is in non-human primates. Okay. Where it didn't make a difference for ancestral virus. Okay. That's right. Have any of you been on a virus hunting expedition? No. Well, I, I would like to be. But I have not, and it will not happen any longer because um, I'm not doing much more research myself. All right, this is now where Amy is leaving. Uh, does poliovirus cause breast cancer? No, absolutely not. There is no connection. I have never seen any connection between uh, poliovirus and breast cancer. It's been great to see Amy on TWIV. You know, John, I do. I agree, but some people are so nasty, they email me and say they don't like it. Can I mean, I don't get people. If you don't like it, just keep it to yourself. If someone, someone said to me the other day, I know this is obnoxious, but I don't like Amy. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm unsubscribing. What kind of person would say, I know it's obnoxious, and then do it. Oh, I forgot a human. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, now everyone wants me to continue. Okay, good, because some people said, I don't come for you, and I don't care after Amy leaves, so I'm glad you like me too. I know you love Amy. That's fine. But if you didn't like me, you could just tell me. You could just tell me and I wouldn't be insulted. In fact, I would do something else. I have a lot of other things that I want to do. And uh, live streaming is uh, part of that for sure. All right. Thank you all for asking me to continue. Uh, uh, I tested positive and I'm, I assume you don't mind my 
prickliness from time to time. I'm sorry. I, I have been good the last few weeks. Today, for some reason, I'm a little prickly. What is it? Why is that? Everything seems to be okay. I don't know why. I tested positive for flu. I had flu vaccine this year. Do you think I would have gotten sicker? I was sick as a dog if I hadn't gotten the flu vax, probably. So what would you call it? Sick as a what? What's sicker than a dog? Uh, yeah, possibly. Uh, but you have to remember that the flu vaccine isn't great. It's, you know, 60% effectiveness against severe flu. So that's something we could improve. People are working on it. A lot of money is being poured into influenza. I'm hoping we get a better vaccine one day. So, yeah, some years it's better than others. So uh, it's not clear to me that you would have had milder disease or not. But you know what? I, I don't think there's a downside to having the flu vaccine every year, even if it gives you a small amount of protection. It's a very different situation from SARS-CoV-2. Or Lampin, other non-PCR nucleic acid tests, the way to go now. Well, I think so, because you don't need a, a, the expensive equipment, right? That's what I would be heading towards, I think. And there are others, you know, involving CRISPR that are quite interesting coming down the pike. So, yeah, the sooner we get away from these cycling machines, the better, in my opinion. Can I choose J and J? Yes, of course. You can mix and match. Yep. Yep. Uh, prions in space. Oh, this is a good question. Dennis. Is, De is this Dennis from uh, Nebraska or uh, one of those states out there? Um, so the problem with prions is you can't destroy them. They're like the alien, the monster in the spaceship, right? You can't, you can't kill it. Um, you can't autoclave them. You can't heat them. I presume you could burn them. But, you know, that's not a really good way to disinfect. Uh, desiccate probably wouldn't do it. So, yeah, they remain. I would say they retain infectivity for a long time. Radiation can affect them, but you need a lot of radiation more than any virus that we know of. So maybe eventually the radiation would do them in in outer space. Uh, but, it, but you know, prions are in mammals, right? Or food prepared from mammals. So they're not just floating around in space. Now, if, if the uh, astronaut, if some astronaut has an unknown prion disease, then yeah, there's a prion in space. But I don't think they're floating around. Right? Why would they be floating around? In space that doesn't make any sense to me give me a scenario where that would happen but i i think it would be more likely that they retain infectivity than a virus but uh, being long enough in the irradiation of of outer space now i guess outer space is the key word there right Does an antibody-dependent enhancement involve virus being escorted to a macrophage and let go there to wreak havoc? Yes, that's the idea. So you have, uh, say, a, an antibody to a virus which binds it and doesn't neutralize it because it's the wrong serotype. And then the FC portion of the antibody attaches to a receptor on a macrophage and the virus now gets in the macrophage where it wouldn't before and wreaks havoc because makes you make more virus because now you have more cells to infect and the max released cytokines which can contribute to the disease. Uh, former incubator tenant sounds like a place husband and I got our visas to visit the Russian Fed. Yeah, third party companies. That's right. They charge. And I still have people coming by, uh, looking, Russian couples come by looking for the company. I said, no, they're long gone. They didn't leave an address. Yep, it's probably the same thing. Yeah. 
What are your thoughts on taking a 17-month-old to a wedding where, of course, we don't know who is and who isn't vaccinated? Probably most people are vaccinated. I would not, if I had a 17-month-old, I wouldn't take it to a wedding. <laughs> um, you know, even though the, uh, even though the, um, the disease rate in, in very young kids is low. It's not zero. So I would be afraid of that because they're not vaccinated. The kids are not vaccinated. And even vaccinated people can shed some virus for a short period of time. So I wouldn't do it, no. that's what, Those are my thoughts. Yeah, I don't have a producer here, but I just joke that maybe someday. Don't we boost once a year with flu? Yeah, we do. To uh, because new when a new variant and when a new flu variant arises, we reformulate the vaccine, right? And um, yeah, so we because in flu we know that when when there's a certain amount of antigenic chain, that's going to cause more disease. What's the problem with COVID? Because we don't know what correlates with more disease. Right now, the vaccine, the original vaccine, is good at at stemming most of the severe disease. So um, it's not the same. It could become the same. But look, it, we have had a series of antigenic variants of SARS-CoV-2, and none of them overcome the vaccine to the extent that they cause more severe disease. And if that did happen one day, I don't know how it would happen, then, yeah, we would change the vaccine. But I don't see any reason to do it now. <clears throat> And Amy is trying to get a job to have her own gig, but she is waiting to hear. We'll, we'll let you know. Any thoughts on long non-coding RNAs on the role they may play in drug design for treating SARS-CoV-2 infection? I, I haven't heard anything about that. That's an interesting question. You mean, so an, an LNC would somehow have to interface with virus, um, and if it's if it's beneficial, you could design a drug to inhibit it, or vice versa. It's not a bad idea. Yeah, uh, I don't know of any identification, but I might have missed it. It's a good question. Good question. I just finished your virology twenty twenty one. Yeah, that's the last one from Columbia. I'm glad you liked it. I think it's a good basic virology course. And this semester, I decided not to post my Columbia lectures because they are virtually identical to the full live stream I did. And I don't think there's any point in posting another series one, maybe next spring. But then I might do a live stream in the fall. So I don't know. It's good to have that kind of a problem, right? <laughs> Uh, my friend stocked up on ivermectin. Waste of time and money. Doesn't help. Nope. Thank you, Pamela, for your contribution. Thank you. They always talk about... Can you not refer to us by they? It seems so impersonal, especially in this forum. But maybe you're talking about not us, but others. I'll give you that benefit of the doubt. Uh, long COVID? Yeah. But we don't know, really, the precise frequency especially after you're vaccinated and i just think you can't worry about it you have to live your life um i don't know anyone with long covid i know all of you do so um i i think the vaccines really impact it and uh, until we get better clinical diagnosis for long covid i think we have to be very careful numbers in mexico have come down the daily deaths have come down very good. Thank you for the update, which I requested. Which I requested. All right. I'm glad you don't mind uh, spicy. Good. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, my students are also slacking off. They're just not interested. I think mine are interested, but they get the... Re I spoil the crap out of them. They... They get their lectures recorded. How could you not show up to Vincent's class? 
Well, that's what I asked, but I can't say that, right? Although maybe Richard is listening and he's he's chatting, but Richard comes to lectures. Um, it, yeah, I would come to my lectures. I don't know why you wouldn't. Maybe they don't care. Maybe they'd rather do something else. Maybe they watch the video and that's fine with them. It's okay. If viruses don't get less dangerous, how will we get back to normal? Immunity. The virus changes, but I don't think it's going to impact disease. I think it's immunity that's impacting our disease. Hello, Ian. Thank you for your contribution. And uh, hello from uh, to New Zealand. Yeah. How does a cytokine storm work? Caroline, this is very timely because the... The TWIV I just recorded with Brianne is talking a lot about that. The um, so the, when you when you get infected, your body initially responds by making a bunch of cytokines uh, that help to amplify the immune response. They recruit cells to the infected area, they increase blood flow, etc. But that whole thing has to be regulated because the cytokines are very potent, and some people don't do a good job at regulating. They probably have genetic differences that limit their ability to regulate the, the cytokine response. And so they make, they overproduce cytokines and they overstimulate and then you get a lot of the severe symptoms. And it's not just COVID that has this cytokine storm. Now, the paper we did with Brianna is very interesting because apparently mice can control, mice and non-human primates can control cytokine production much better than humans can. And that had implications for the RNA vaccines. Fascinating story. Listen to it. You'll like it because Brianna and I try and make it understandable. Uh, what's the likelihood that we find the cave or bats that SARS-2 came from? I think it's pretty low to find the, the cave. I think we now know we have now found quite similar viruses to SARS-CoV-2 in uh, bats throughout Southeast Asia and caves throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, I think the, the evidence tells us that the Huanan market was the uh, epicenter, and I think that's the best we're going to get for sure. Students get used to watching video. Well, yes, that's it. Because if they didn't have video, they'd have to come to class. But I make the video because I think they learn easier by watching the video. Because in class, they have to take notes. If they miss something, it's gone forever. And since I started teaching this course at Columbia 15 years ago, I have always recorded it. Because I want them to have a good learning experience. And so when every year after the halfway point, they stop showing up. Because I don't say anything. I don't take attendance. And it's I understand they can watch and still get the material. But there's nothing like being in class and then listening to the video, okay? And I don't understand why they don't take advantage of it. But I'm not going to change. I'm not going to take attendance. It's, but the one thing I can do is say, look, if you want a letter of recommendation for graduate school or medical school, don't ask if you don't come to class because there's no way I know who you are. And that's the one thing I can do because a lot of students want letters. Have many disinfectant products claim to neutralize Nora, but when you look at the details, it usually specifies feline calici, right? <laughs> because it's hard to grow human neuroviruses in the lab. Uh, and um, I think it's quite similar probably. Uh, it, it's not the same. I mean, it's genetically very similar. They're in the same family, right? But they could have very, uh, really different properties. But that's the best you can do. Yeah. One in 11 people has COVID. That doesn't really matter, Bobby, because probably uh, they're mild. They're mostly mild infections. So, you know, one in 11 people has a common cold corona. Probably more. Probably 10 out of 11. It doesn't really matter. I love Amy, but her answers are almost often yes, no, do you think? Well, so Amy is a scientist, and I'm a scientist teacher. That's the difference. I understand the value of extended answers. Uh, Amy is brilliant, but is not a teacher. 
doesn't want to be a teacher. She wants to be a scientist. I'm not surprised. BA2 should be in sewer water in the Northeast. Yeah. Okay, we should wrap it up, right? We got a minute. Um, okay, let's uh, take it down. Come back next week with some of these la great questions. I want to thank these people who have contributed to the incubator. Thank you, Ivara, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for sending me the article. Uh, you sent it a few days ago. Well, I'm probably a few days behind in my my email. I'm surprised that Peter Marx did this. Yeah, I am too. I read his statement and I'm I'm actually surprised. It's too bad. Um, what was I going to say? I really should delegate my email reading to someone, right? How about that bar in Madison? Well, I'll be in Madison in July, as I told you. We'll have to figure out some place to go. I'll let you know. Unless someone lives there and knows a place where we can go and chat, that would be great because there might be a couple of people there. Yeah, the, the common cold coronas tend to mess up people in nursing homes. That's right. Thank you, Siddhartha, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. <laughs> I love speculation. I get mad when it's presented as fact, especially with the intent to scare people. I 100% agree with you. I never speculate to scare people. and that's And it also bothers me. Absolutely right. I have trouble staying away from questions. I had a very serious seventh grade teacher. First class was about how to set up parameters of an experiment. I have a new appreciation for her. So that's why I'm in science. I had a great biology teacher in high school. She was great. And she got me very excited about uh, biology. All right. Let me... Um, no, no, there will be virology live. But... It's gonna, it might be virology live or it might be coronavirus or it might be viruses live, right? Which is the virus course. But there'll be some kind of live virology course. Is there someone say Taos? It's green chili cheese bagels here in Taos. I love Taos. I used to go there quite a bit for meetings. Great place. Good to hear from it. Tell me, have an immunologist come sometime? Yes, I know, because I don't know any immunology. I get it. <laughs> um, Brianne said she would she would do a live stream. <clears throat> um, I just have to... We'll do a, a, a one-off. We will not make it part of uh, Q&A, because this is Q&A. So you're going to have to keep your eyes posted for a Brianne and for a B&V, right? Uh, Udell would do a live stream, yeah. But... Um, I want to have Brianne also first, okay? Uh, it, John talks a lot. It's great. But you know, in a group thing, you need to let other people talk, right? I'm sure he could do that. All right. Let me get to the end here. Very good, folks. Thanks for coming tonight. We have currently 511 of you, please uh, hit the like button. We only have 349. Go over 400, please, before I say goodbye. Uh, thanks all for coming. The moderators, Steph, Les, Tom, Frank, Vanity. Thanks for doing this tonight. I appreciate it. It was kind of a calm night in terms of uh, moderation, right? Not too bad. And thanks all of you for coming. I'm beginning to recognize many of you. Thanks to the new folks for coming. Thanks for bringing your questions. They're really great questions. And please come back uh, next week. We will be here Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. for your questions. You have great questions. I really appreciate it. They challenge me and make me think, and I love that. That's the best part of teaching besides teaching people. And so, folks... That's that's it for another Q and A. Uh, until next time, please stay safe. Good night.